And first on BBC One Scotland, we're making the news. Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. My name is William Hague and I'm in charge for the next 30 minutes, which is about average for a leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> in the news this week, at a factory in Slough, picketing gets out of hand in the Slumberland dispute. <laughs> in London, Peter Stringfellow's very first girlfriend returns to ask for her old job back. And at a pub in Dudley, the landlord announces that the pork scratchings lorry has been sighted on the ring road. <laughs> Oni and Hislop's team is a political commentator and Newsnight regular who recently told The Guardian that if it helps get across a political point, he doesn't mind being regarded as a figure of fun. Well, join the club, mate. Please welcome <laughs> Mark Mardell. <laughs> And with Paul Merton tonight, a comedy actor and writer who was recently described by trade magazine The Stage as being definitely part of the comedy cool crowd. <laughs> not tonight, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, please welcome Peter Sterofinowicz. The Stage. <laughs> and so we start with round one. Paul and Peter, here's yours. OK, that's uh, it's a BBC television centre, obviously, there, and it's, uh, this is the BBC strike. Um, various, yeah. These are various people drafted in to read the news. Um, oh, God, he's still following me. That's <laughs> Michael Gray <laughs> and Mark Thompson. That's, all, that's what it's about, really. Yeah. Yep, this is the devastating strike at the BBC that yeah. paralysed virtually nothing. Uh, and uh, <laughs> some of those people didn't go to work, but who did go to work? Terry Wogan, yes. Terry Wogan. Terry Wogan yeah, did go to work, and he, he went to um, work. And uh, he, I, I saw a quote in a paper from him saying, uh, he said something like, "You know, I sympathise with them, but I've got a contract. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a freelancer." <laughs> well, I had a very bizarre morning on Monday because I woke up and put on Radio Four, and it was just a minute. <laughs> and I thought, "Oh God, Nicholas Parsons has died." Uh, <laughs> and then there was about five minutes of Merton. I thought, God, Paul's died! <laughs> it must have been a cruel disappointment That's... for you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might win this week. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the good-looking bloke? Uh, that's Cole. Is it Stephen Cole? Because didn't he get more viewers than when there isn't a strike? Well, I think he <laughs> tuned in to see what it would be he like. He did. Let's have a look at Cole. There he is, the unlikely star of the strike. He replaced Hugh Edwards on the 10 o'clock news, and he attracted 200,000 more viewers than it did the previous week. <laughs> Let's have a look at one thing which went completely wrong. Camelot now wants to bid for a third licence. Here's our economic editor, Evan Davis. Good afternoon. Second year in a row, the numbers are up for Camelot. OK. It's, Tim, it's not the one, it's News 24. Apologise for the loss of their <laughs> back story there. Evan Davis should be in our studio in central London. Ah, oh, there he is. Good afternoon, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you work? I was on holiday. Oh. The old Wogan excuse. Oh, no, I would have gone on strike, fully support it. Would you? Yeah. But to get you on, even though you were on holiday or on strike, uh, they could have played the famous film of you with Andrew Neil, couldn't they? Singing. They could have done. On the way to Amarillo. Yes. And since they, they didn't, I think we should now do that. <laughs> Let's have a look at that. more butch than the soldiers who tried it, don't you think? <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, there was a very good interview with John Humphreys. He had on uh, Mark Byford, a man from the BBC, and he was unbelievably rude to him. 
<laughs> Instead of it being politician, he was just fantastically rude to his boss. He's rude to everybody. Yeah, but it's great. He said, are you going to ACAS? And the bloke said, well, no, we're not sure. Are you going to ACAS? And then in the evening, they went to ACAS. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was sort of politics in action. One viewer wrote to the uh, BBC website with this. Uh, Thank you for a day off from unambitious breakfast drivel and tedious regional rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the entirely justified strike by hard-working BBC staff. Hang on, someone's changed my auto cue here. <laughs> um, amongst the big names who joined the 13,000 workers on strike was Natasha Kaplinsky, largely because 10,000 of those are employed to do her makeup. <laughs> Ian and Mark, take a look at this. Michael Howard, who made a catastrophic mistake of resigning almost as soon as the election was. I can't imagine anybody doing that, can you, really? <laughs> <laughs> a man who no one remembers. Uh, uh, there, these are the, the odds. Oh, look. Where's Will Ooh. William Hague, 13 to 2. <laughs> um, now, yes, this is the quest for the greatest honour in the world of politics, of course. Well, and, losing um, the next election. What's, what's, <laughs> what's Michael Howard tried to do this week? This week, the Conservative MPs and Norman Tebbit and other people great from the past are saying, you've got to go by July, you've got to get it over with quickly. They don't want to repeat the mistakes that other people have made. Mm. <laughs> well, look, no, no, that's I'm, right, but it's, it's you're being un and William, no, he's being unfair to you. I think the central issue here is you were responsible for Ian Duncan Smith. <laughs> yeah. It was a voting system which, whatever its merits, produced IDS. Now, Howard wants to have a system that doesn't produce IDS, which is reasonable. <laughs> so you're definitely not coming back. No, 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 no. I can just about manage this bunch of comedians, but I can't manage that bunch of comedians. <laughs> Excuse me, are you managing us? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> you're managing us, are it's you? Subtle, yes. <laughs> it's subtle, yes. It's fucking subtle from what I'm saying. <laughs> Did you resign? because you'd strangled somebody and you didn't want them to find out. <laughs> that's, the one, that's the rumour. <laughs> you no, see, that's a question no. he hasn't had before. Yeah. That's <laughs> uh, and, um, and what's Ken Clark doing, according to Michael Heseltine? Mm. Agonising. He's yes. playing the he, long game. He's basically, <laughs> his mate Heseltine has said to him, do you want to spend the, the rest of your time sort of getting this bunch into shape, or would you rather be... Uh, flogging cigarettes to the Burmese and uh, having a few pints down the local, enjoying yourself. <laughs> yes, he's, uh, according to Michael Hesseltine, Ken is contemplating the most incredible human sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was still legal. Uh, and and, and, and also, as you say, Mark, he is also said to be agonising in private. And I think at his age, he should eat more fibre. <laughs> uh, so, yes, this is... Um, the big decision as to who's going to lose to Gordon Brown at the next election, it says here. Under new rules, would-be Conservative MPs can be deselected for any one of a number of reasons. These include being convicted of a criminal offence. So no comeback for Geoffrey Archer. Falsification of a CV. Uh, sorry, Geoffrey. Um, <laughs> Conduct unbecoming a candidate, inadequate performance as a candidate, being the cause of embarrassing media coverage. <laughs> Time to start work on another book, Geoffrey. <laughs> Wasn't he yeah. your candidate for Mayor of London? He was. You yes, backed we, him up, didn't we've you? We've discussed this on this program before. <laughs> There's nothing we really like really owe the viewers uh, something, something new, really. No, no, yes, they I'm, like the old stuff. I've, I've already, already confessed to this mistake. Yeah, but um, can we hear it again? Uh, <laughs> you have just heard it again. <laughs> so at the end of that round, two, two points each. Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. And so to round two and the picture spin quiz. Fingers on the buzzers, teams. Here's your first picture. Mark? It's the new leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> no. This Could is the, this is the Lonely a, Planet. It server. is. Excellent, yes. It's the new edition of the Lonely Planet Guide to Great Britain. Lots of towns and cities up north are, are invigorated. Manchester is wonderful. Uh, Leeds is the Knightsbridge of the North. Uh, Newcastle's thriving, so it's just basically, you know, it's not just about London, there's other major sort of cities that are up and running. That's right. That hat looks like it's um, been digitally put on. Yeah, is this? <laughs> what you actually wear? You are brilliant, aren't you? No, no, no. Really, the real William's been put digitally put on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Peter, you're from Liverpool, aren't you? You must yes. have been very proud when they lifted the trophy this week. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's brilliant. As are we all. It's brilliant. Although, you know, when it got to like 3-3, I just thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, if they just said, you know, look, we've had a smashing game. <laughs> Why don't we just say it's a draw and we, we're, we're both winners, you know. It's the playing of the game that counts. You know. but I, I, You're not I, a football fan. I'm not you, a though. football fan. <laughs> Yesterday, the fans, of course, turned out at Liverpool Airport to welcome the team home. And here's the plane after they left it out overnight, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry, William, you have, as a Conservative MP, you've made a rude joke about Liverpool. Mm. And normally, what happens... <laughs> ..is that you have to go up there and apologise. Yes, yes absolutely. Personally. <laughs> um, and uh, yesterday, ITN did their broadcast live from outside Anfield, and Mark Austin was trying to host the news rather foolishly. Let's have a look at that. There are hundreds of thousands to take to the streets for a party that, uh, well, as you can hear, has gone on ever since. Also nursing hangovers, no doubt, were the players themselves who touched down back at the city's John Lennon Airport well, within the last couple of hours or so. Before the final day of the Tim Rogers now chants the hero's homecoming. Shouldn't he just get out of the way of the car? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a great follower of the game, but I thought someone here would know that thing the goalie did, that sort of... <laughs> just before... Is that legal? It's, it's based on something that Bruce Grobel, our Liverpool goalkeeper, did 20-odd years ago, where he was sort of, like, wobbling. Apparently, as long as you don't come off the line, it is legal, yes. Because he did that thing like an old Space Invaders thing. Yeah. Do, yeah. Do. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. I, I think all football should be five minutes. Penalties. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, this is the new Lonely Planet Guide to Great Britain, which praises Britain in general and the North in particular. The guide's writer noted, Liverpool is no longer full of smart-ass scallies who would as soon nick your car as tell you a joke. <laughs> Adding, hang on, where's my car gone? You've done it again! And, and You've like, done it again! <laughs> I'd like to thank Boris Johnson for that joke, so he has to go and give it. the apology. Let's get that clear. <laughs> And our northern poet, Ian Macmillan, agreed with the guide's findings, saying, Barnsley is the new Tuscany. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Barnsley. When the Blairs hear this, they'll be turning up for a free holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, team, stand by for the next picture. Fingers on the buzzers. Right, there we go, Paul and oh, Peter. This is about to celebrate 200 years of the Battle of Waterloo, 200th anniversary, and they're going to restage it. But um, it's not going to be the French against the British, it's going to be the blue team against the red team, because the French will be observing and we don't want to upset them. So if they don't know the result, we're not going to tell them. <laughs> if you don't want to know what the result is, look yeah. away from the screen now. So it's, it's red versus blue, isn't it? That's what it's, it's not going Waterloo, It's though, Trafalgar. Trafalgar. Trafalgar, I mean. Yeah. We don't want to admit publicly that we beat the France. The France. Beat the France. <laughs> I can't even say it, it's so painful. <laughs> it is strange, isn't it? It's like uh, teaching people about World War II and uh, not mentioning that the Germans were on the other side. Mm. Uh, but we're not it's... meant to now. Every time anyone says anything on this show, you get a complaint from the German ambassador. <laughs> oh, you are so backward, you English. Why can't you just forget it all? Is he here? <laughs> Yeah. Well, while I go to Liverpool, you can go to the German embassy. <laughs> it's not the first time that Nelson's been tampered with. When they re-enacted Nelson going up the Thames with Lady Hamilton, the health and safety people insisted they wear this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just like paintings. <laughs> <laughs> Who's sponsoring this? Easy history. What's this? <laughs> All orange. And talking of political correctness, this week the TUC have brought out a guide to the use of inappropriate language. And which words for elderly people do they say shouldn't be used? Coffin dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. That's one. Definitely. That's one. Brinkers. <laughs> well, actually, grandma and granddad. Uh, oh. Because being old carries connotations of being worn out and of little further use. <laughs> So, 
a good week for political correctness. This week it was announced that to avoid any offence, a reenactment of Britain's victory over France at the Battle of Trafalgar would be fought between a red fleet and a blue fleet. Just a little tip, if you want to put a bet on it, the cheese-eating surrender monkeys are in the red at this time. <laughs> You're, not, you're really not coming back to politics, are you? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the conclusive proof, yeah, really. Yeah, um, yeah. This week saw the publication of the TUC's Guide to Inappropriate Language. Among the terms deemed unacceptable are spicks, dagos, arges, krauts and wops. Wouldn't it be easier just to stop Prince Philip from going out? <laughs> yeah. Among the words now deemed offensive is paddy. Not sure how you'd refer to a paddy field. Presumably that place where the chinkies get their rice from. <laughs> so... <laughs> now... Is it Bernard Manning we have here? <laughs> <laughs> when you were making that speech at the age of 16, did you think your life would turn up and you ended up on a light entertainment <laughs> programme calling Chinese people chinkies? <laughs> I do know that I said half of you won't be here in 30 years' time, and when I went back last year and looked at them 28 years later, all the same people are still there. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been and gone in the meantime. <laughs> um, so now it's time for our next picture. Mm. Uh, yes, that is Ian and Mark. That's the next Prime Minister. It's Gordon Brown. Gordon selling off houses cheaply to uh, first-time yes. buyers. There we are. That's... <laughs> I'd be extremely pleased about it, but we can't see what's <laughs> going on below the picture, of course. He's announced that people shouldn't have to wait to get into the homes of their choice, like number 10. <laughs> <laughs> they should be allowed to go in now. Exactly. What was the phrase he actually used? Anybody know? It was first time buyers supporting... Cheap mortgages. Them. He said people who can't afford the full price of their house can just ramp up their stake. No need for that sort of language, I would have thought. <laughs> um, that picture, they, yes. they're really desperate to sell their house behind them, yeah. aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> you see what's confusing, they're trying to let it and sell it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I bet somebody comes round to let it and they hide all the for sale signs. <laughs> and then vice versa. Yeah. So, fingers on the buzzers for our next picture. Yes, Ian and Mark, quick off the mark again. Yep, this is the political ones for us. Um, <laughs> this is Crazy Frog. A ringtone and now a pop hit by a German band, I believe. Now he's, a, he's a major recording artist, Crazy Frog. What does it <laughs> sound like? Give us a rendition, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you got me there. <laughs> I do know it's displaced the popular singer Coldplay. <laughs> Wriggling out of an answer. Let's have a look at the real thing. It's a frog who's turned into an Olympic swimmer and then put a boiled egg on his head. <laughs> it's um, very curious. Yeah. Well, he's crazy. Could be, yes. you know, he's mentally ill. Yeah. He's mentally ill. <laughs> it did begin as a joke when a Swedish teenager recorded himself <laughs> imitating his friend's moped. Yes. You're right. And he said, uh, we had mad laughs. We found it very, very funny. We laughed until we had tears. <laughs> but there were teenagers and they were in Sweden. <laughs> So yes, this is the crazy frog ringtone phenomenon. Apparently it's only adults who find crazy frog irritating. According to one media analyst, kids love it. It's the latest playground thing. Bring back Chinese burns. <laughs> Was he a friend of yours? <laughs> sort of mixed race. <laughs> Born in Edinburgh, but lived in Shanghai. <laughs> fond, very fond memories, yes. Chinky burns um, like <laughs> It's going to be a busy weekend for the crazy frog. On Sunday morning, he's going to be number one, and on Sunday evening, he's going to lose a referendum. <laughs> <laughs> so, frog Frenchman. fingers on buzzers God, for our very next racist question. It's yeah. yeah. extremely racist. racist. Yeah. Part two should be you apologising to everybody <laughs> you've offended. Let's carry on. 
Yes, Paul and Peter. <laughs> They've discovered the root of sarcasm. They've got a formula for sarcasm. Um, the part of the brain where it comes from, it's just that little bit there, I'm just pointing to it there. Uh, that's the sarcasm little booth, it's called. Sarcasm booth. <laughs> <laughs> Where's irony? <laughs> you sound like George Bush. <laughs> no, what next irony? to Iraq? <laughs> 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 In order to locate the part of the brain that understands sarcasm, researchers studied 25 people with prefrontal lobe damage and 16 people with posterior lobe damage, after which they were allowed to go back to watching Celebrity Love Island. <laughs> <laughs> which means at the end of this round, it is Ian and Mark with four points and Paul and Peter with five points. Yay! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So we arrive at round three, the odd one out round. Just one between you this week. Mini Driver, Jerry Adams, Winston Churchill and Peter Serafinowicz. Yes, I think I know what it is. Well, I think I sort of know about 75, 76% of the answer. I reckon it's... That would be enough to own Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's people uh, being impersonated or um, passed off as somebody else. I did the voice of Darth Maul in The Phantom Menace and um, I, I overdubbed uh, an actor called Ray Park. Mm -hmm. And um, Winston Churchill's famous speech wasn't actually... Um... The radio broadcasts were done by an actor called Norman Shelley, who, um, who, who was a big radio actor at the time, did Toy Town and Larry the Lamb as well. And, so he, he, uh, and some of the famous speeches that we associate with Churchill actually were him on the radio. That was Norman Shelley. <laughs> it wasn't Winston Churchill. Can't you put Fair Zavor again. behind you? You go on and on and on. <laughs> He's definitely here. He's definitely here. <laughs> Jerry Adams was, of course, famously dubbed when we weren't allowed to hear him because of the oxygen of publicity. Yeah. And Minnie Driver... Um... She did a film and I think someone else sang on it or someone else spoke on it. I think Winston no. Churchill was the odd one out. Why? Because somebody impersonated him, his own voice, and other, the other people were impersonated no, by... No, isn't Peter the odd one out because he does voiceovers impersonating people and all uh, the others have it done to them? Very good, yes. The answer is they've all been voiced by others, apart from Peter Serafinowicz, oh, who right. voiced the part of Darth Maul in Star Wars. You idiot! Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 you know, when you're the odd one out, yeah, it's hard for you to realise that you are. You, know? you can't see it. I know, you can't see so it. So, apparently you made George Lucas laugh with your Darth Vader impression, didn't you? <laughs> yes, well, it's just so something I used to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> let's hear, you did such a good Terry uh, Wogan, I think we need Darth God, Vader as well. Oh, you don't have to. If you I want will. to, you can. Oh, I go will. I will. I said something. <laughs> a presence I've not felt since... Oh. And then he just walks off. <laughs> And what about uh, Winston Churchill? I think Paul got that uh, right, Norman Shelley. And do you know how he got into the part? I don't know. Did he say... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he took out his false teeth before he voiced Winston Churchill. Oh, really? And Why was he wearing right. Winston Churchill's false teeth? <laughs> 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 so, yes. Um, the so, answer yes. is... So, he was wearing Winston Churchill's teeth? <laughs> I have no idea, either. You the don't know? The answer <laughs> is... <laughs> You sit there as a quiz master, unless it's written up there, you know, you know, well, I was going to say f*** all, but I won't. <laughs> so you can say that, we'll cut it out at the end. Oh, we, we! <laughs> we cut it out! I'm sharp here. Um, <laughs> describing his first big break in Hollywood, Peter said, basically, I did grunts and growls while George Lucas watched from the camera. <laughs> well, whatever it takes to get into show business. <laughs> In the early 1990s, broadcasting restrictions meant that the voice of Jerry Adams was redubbed using an unknown Irish actor called Ali. When the ban was lifted, Ali told reporters, obviously it's a significant move in terms of peace in Ireland. Although financially it's a bit of a blow. <laughs> <laughs> and now to the missing words round, which this week welcomes as its guest publication, The Waller and Diker. <laughs> The official magazine of the Dry Stone Walling Association. <laughs> Here we go with Duchess is what as she samples Devon cider? Mm. Fingered. <laughs> yeah. The answer is cheered. Mm. 
It's the same thing in Devon. <laughs> Camilla attended the Devon Country and Livestock Show. Uh, the crowd cheered, although there was one embarrassing incident when the judge slapped her bottom and pinned a rosette behind her ear. <laughs> Next, gone bald, just what? Become leader of the Tory party. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually blame it on mum. Yes, it appears I can blame my baldness on my mother. She used to slap me around the head shouting, when are you going to be prime minister? <laughs> <laughs> Next, learn what on a steep slope in Rotmel? A diking. Walling, stone walling. Oh, well, Paul's got the right answer for once. Yes, it is diking. diking. Oh, yeah. According to Waller and Diker, members from the central Scotland branch spent a hugely enjoyable weekend in Rotmel repairing dikes in the drizzling rain. <laughs> One member said, a very enjoyable weekend. We should have gone for a week. <laughs> Next, you will have what? Oh, it's my friend again. Yeah. <laughs> you will have to go on about Zavor all the time. <laughs> Winston Churchill. Uh, <laughs> he's quite camp, isn't he, this German? Yeah. <laughs> he's getting camp. Yeah. <laughs> so call me as a camp commandant. I don't know why. <laughs> You will have fun, is Dyslexia. the answer. The answer is fun. <laughs> a new survey reveals that when Germans take a holiday, they have difficulty relaxing. I'm not so sure if anyone's got a history of making themselves feel at home in other people's countries, it's the Germans. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to write to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <you laughs> so the final score, uh, Paul and Peter have seven, but Ian and Mark have 11. Oh, <laughs> We've just time for the caption competition. Mm. <laughs> Is it Doctor Who budget slashed? <laughs> Subject keen to my heart. <laughs> Box marriages to be made legal. Box marriages to be made legal. <laughs> if you look carefully, there's a veil and flowers coming out of it. Oh, yeah, but is it box marriages to be made legal? <laughs> I declare you box and box. <laughs> May you go on to have many little cards. <laughs> many smiling. <laughs> on which note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Mark Mardell, Paul Merton and Peter Serafinowicz. And I leave you with news that as her husband's passport photos finally emerge from the machine, Pauline Prescott has to admit it's a good likeness. <laughs> There's another cliffhanger ending in BBC Four's new accountancy drama. <laughs> and on a visit to her son's student digs, Sherry Blair soon regrets trying Ewan's special mushroom omelette. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs>